yin yoga is. So it is another style of yoga. And so what we are teaching is mostly um, vinyasa. You guys have done Hot 26, go so for a taste of that. Um, you guys also can do a little bit of kids yoga with me, a bit of prenatal yoga. So these are all different styles that you can pursue if this is a style that resonates with you. Okay? So just as a bit of a, like an interest say, you do not need to do an additional yin yoga training in order to teach yoga. The 200 hours is sufficient. However, well, let me just say, you can teach yin yoga with a 200 hour training. However, we're only doing two hours of yin now. And so we don't really get to learn the fullness of the practice and how much it offers us in terms of how to use props, different ways of sequencing. We also go much deeper into traditional Chinese medicine about the meridian theory, the five elements, because it pulls from a lot of different um, modalities and philosophies. So it's quite different in its approach, but a beautiful, beautiful practice. And so we do offer, just like the prenatal and the yin and the kids, we offer additional 50 hours only in that, just to build up your own confidence. Okay. So you go to Chinese version. So I'll tell you now. So it actually pulls from a lot of different philosophies. So it's based on the Taoist concept of yin and yang. So we all know yin and yang as opposite complementary principles in nature. Okay. So we'll chat a bit more about that. But how the actual practice of yin yoga came about was um, through Paul Brilly. So he, if I can say, I say popularized yin yoga because it's not as if he created it. He just took a lot of inspiration and, and named it. Okay, so he was essentially him and one of his students, um, Sarah Powers, that they named their yoga style yin yoga because of how it differed from other modern yoga styles. And it's tricky to read, a little bit scary. They're a fright. No, it's just you. Oh, it's just you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone was kind of squinting at the board. Okay. So Paul Brilly was originally kind of like a vinyasa flow kind of teacher. And he was once watching TV in like the 90s. And he saw Paulie Zink on TV. And he said, not in these words, my, that is the most flexible man I've ever seen in my life. And there was this um, video of Paulie Zink who did Taoist yoga which was a mixture of movements that's kind of martial arts with long held stretches. And he is incredibly, incredibly flexible. So his movement style was a combination of holding poses for really long, mixed with martial arts kind of style, mixed with some yoga poses. And that's what he called as Taoist yoga. If you're not familiar with Taoism, it's a Chinese philosophy, which it's one of the many philosophies that stem from ancient China. And the belief of that is more yin and yang is a concept in Taoism, but the entire Taoist philosophy is about going with the flow, connecting to the natural harmony of nature. Everything that lives in nature lives in us too. So when seasons are changing, that impacts us. We need to constantly strive for this balance, which is the yin and the yang, all right? When we're busy, we need to complement our daily busy lifestyle with more subtle calmer practices. You know, in the summer, when things are busy and hot, we might want to do something cooler. And so there's constant striving to come back to the organic order, which is what they call a Okay, So that's what um, Paulie Zink influenced this philosophy into his movements with martial arts and stuff like that. Okay, So Paul really first saw him, he went to go study dollars and yoga, and he also attributed two other teachers who played a very big role on his, in the, um, his understanding of what came to be yin yoga. So Dr. Gary Parker, who taught him anatomy. So yin yoga has very much, a, a very similar, to, a similar approach to anatomy that we have at wellness, which is very functional. So we look at bone structure, skeletal differences, understanding that each body is different. And also looking at specifically in yin yoga, because we hold poses for longer, so three to six minutes per pose, um, and we do it often cooler, it's not with the intention of stretching the muscles, but rather working into the connective tissue that's the bones, the tendons, the ligaments, the joint capsule, and through that long held stretch, really getting into this kind of traction in that connective tissue. All right? You might have also heard about fascia, which is like a big word that we sometimes don't really know how much it includes, 
but fascia is the term given to any other connective tissue that is not bone, ligaments, tendons. So it's actually known as the other, but it's the essentially the connective tissue that surrounds every single muscle fiber, every single muscle it, around our organs. It's all over the body. And it's kind of, um, if I can say, it's kind of like this gooey substance, dynamic, constant moving, it's kind of hard to explain. But it is, what you guys need to know is it's just a connective tissue around the body. And so when we're doing yin yoga that's longer holds, we don't work into, it's not that we don't work into the muscles, the muscles will work anyway, but the muscles are relaxed so that we can target the bones, connective tissue, ligaments, and tendons. Yeah. And the intention is to provide or put them under a moderate amount of stress for long periods of time, knowing that stress is not always a bad thing. As you guys see in your anatomy, stress is good. Okay. So we place a moderate amount of stress and then we give them a chance to recover so that it can become stronger over time in very simple forms, okay? So Paul, really, when you do your yoga, we speak about fascia, we speak about anatomy, the bones, we kind of recover all the joint mo uh, movements that you guys have covered in anatomy. And so we look at what's happening in the poses when we're holding them for five minutes at a time, okay? And then Dr. Hiroshi Motoyama, who also, um, Paul really also learned a lot about Taoism with him, but specifically, looking at certain aspects of traditional Chinese medicine of the um, energetic body. So if we look at yin yoga, it really pulls from two different ideologies. Okay? You've got your Indian Hatha system where we get the poses or um, Indian Hatha lineage, but then you've also got your traditional Chinese medicine lineage where we look at the meridians and how energy, what we call chi, flows through the energy channel so that we can be healthy, we can live with vitality and live without any disease or things like that. Okay, so it's all about when the energy in the body is flowing sufficiently, then the body can be in its most vit vitality form, can be most vital. Okay, so what it is simply when you when you study the yin training, you see a lot of different um essentially two different philosophies merging. Okay, so we speak about yoga poses and we also speak about chi and meridians. But you can also do classes that aren't specifically sequenced towards a meridian, but also just work purely on certain joints of the body. So it's quite diverse in what it offers, but just from there you can see the big anatomy component, energetic subtle body component, and Taoism as a philosophy about being in touch with nature and connected to the natural harmony of the world. Okay. So if we look at the concept of yin and yang, so yin is, if we look at our yin tissues, it's ligaments, tendons, joints, fascial networks, and our yin practice is more allowing and nourishing. So if we look at characteristics of yin, it's cool, dark, slow, passive, more restorative. Those are certain aspects of it. <coughs> Compared to yang, which is more dynamic, active, hot, daylight, bright, busy, those kind of aspects, okay? So these are two, you guys have all seen this yin yang symbol before, right? Mm -hmm. So we've got this balance of yin and yang that's always, it's always dynamic. Okay, balance is never static. We're not sitting on one edge or we're not sitting in the middle balance perfectly. There's constant, <coughs> almost polarity between the two. So as nature changes, as seasons change, our lifestyle changes too. So a simple example that we can understand or maybe resonate with is when it's, um, when our lives are very busy and we are running around, we want to go to work, we come home, all of, you know, everything's a little bit manic. Maybe you've got family living with you and everything's a bit chaotic. You can use a practice like yin yoga to bring in a little bit more nourishment, allowing relaxation, stress relief into your practice. However, sometimes when it's winter 
we um, maybe we start becoming a little bit more relaxed and calm, or a little bit more chilled. And so in that case, we might want something a little bit more dynamic to bring us up. So you're kind of working with this complementary balance of working between dynamic and passive. Okay, and so there's never, we're never going to be able to be in perfect harmony and be balanced always. It's constantly like a little yo-yo. And so the yin practice is really beneficial, not only from a psychological point of view of mindfulness, calming, relaxing, nourishing, but also we're not targeting, um, can we strengthen and stretch the muscles? Can we get circulation going? Can we increase the breathing rate? We're now being passive and targeting a different kind, in, uh, targeting the body in a different kind of way, but in a way that's also very beneficial. So just because we're not running or sweating or flowing in a class doesn't mean it's not a form of exercise. It's it's also exercise in a different way because we're working with different tissues. So it's kind of a bit of a mind shift, and it's also really nice to teach because it's incredibly restorative. And lovely. Okay. Any questions on that? I mean, when we do our fifty hours, we spend like ten hours chatting philosophy, and that was about ten minutes. <laughs> but you guys get the idea, just to see where this comes from. Okay. As I can show, who has never done yin yoga before? One, two, three, four, five, oh, six. Cool. This is so much fun later. It's gonna be a game changer. I love it. It's my favorite. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So this is the meridians, okay? So the meridian theory is based on traditional Chinese medicine. So these are the same meridians that acupuncturists or acupressurists will use. So it's the energy lines. If you're looking traditionally at Chinese medicine, it's the energy lines through which energy flows. So we call in traditional Chinese medicine, they call energy qi, but it's spelled Q-I. And so there's 12 principal meridians, all address or all targeting a certain organ. But it's not so much that the stomach meridian is only the stomach. It's more, it's broader than that. It's more diverse than that. It's the organ plus everything that it does. So nothing in the entire body is seen in isolation. Everything is incubated and working together, right? So you can see all these energy lines run along certain parts of the body. So what we do in yin yoga, you can, you don't have to, but you can, use yin poses to target certain meridians all right so if my meridians right along the front of my body i can do a class that's more forward folding and back bending to either uh, lengthen along that area where the meridian lies or to compress for a moment and then provide a release okay because the intention of uh, not only your poses but acupuncture and acupressure is to facilitate the flow of energy and to remove blockages. Okay, so this is just to show you where all the meridians lie. And if there was meridians in the upper body, we could do certain poses in the upper body that target those certain areas. So it becomes quite um, themed in terms of there's always an intention. So we're not always uh, sequencing to a peak pose. We can be sequencing according to a meridian, we can sequence according to a joint. So for example, we can do a class centered around the shoulders. We can just do a general class that's intention is to be a bit more mindful and still. So we, we have a little bit more freedom in terms of how we propose it together. And there is an element of working progressively, but it doesn't slow. It's one pose and then the next, as we'll experience later. Okay, any questions at this point? When you say the difference between yin and yeah, yang, yeah, yeah. Um, so are both of these part of yin yoga? Is there also yang yoga? No. <laughs> so well, surprisingly, surprisingly, what I discovered. <laughs> so yeah, we yin yoga was originally used as a descriptive term. So they used the term yin to describe the type of yoga they're doing. So we only know everything in the world because of contrast. I only know it's dark because it's light, okay? I only know it's hot because I know what cold is. Mm -hmm. So our entire understanding of what we know is based on contrasts and polarity. So we, they were to say, oh, this yoga has over the years become more dynamic and more active as opposed to possibly 
original yoga forms, which is like, what is original yoga forms, but make a traditional hatha that was very static and slow. Progressively, it's become more yang-like. I would say yang, teachers like Paul Grady and uh, uh, Bernie Clark, who's another incredible yin yoga teacher, they say yang, tomato, tomato, yin yang. <laughs> so um, as yoga has become more yang-like, they start saying, well, I'm actually doing yoga that's more yin-like. And so that's where the name yin came from as a descriptive term. But you get certain practices like restorative yoga that are more yin than yin. Okay. But vinyasa is more yang than yin. Yeah. But hot vinyasa is more yang than vinyasa. Okay. So that being said, we can say that vinyasa is yang yoga. Paul Brilly actually has specific flows that he calls yang yoga, which is specific yoga flows combining yoga poses with martial arts kind of movements because of the chi meridian influence. It's about slow, precise movements. So he has stipulated a few kind of like yang flows, but we don't say I'm going to a yang yoga class. You know? <laughs> but interestingly enough, there is people who practice yin also need yang because it's not like one is the be all and end all. I do need balance. So if I was teaching, um, if I was practicing a lot of yin, I also need a bit of yang to complement it. Whether that be vinyasa yoga, a run, a walk, swimming, whatever. Okay. Any questions? Soon there'll be yang, yang yoga classes. Soon there will, I'm sure. Okay. So yin yoga works on three principles. And so we're going to practice it in the class. Now, these are quite important, I find, because I think it, it sets yoga, yin yoga apart from other practices in terms of how it's presented. So poses are held for anything from three to five minutes to longer, and it often uses a lot of props. The poses are predominantly floor-based, so you're either seated or lying, and... Um, in, you know, there's one standing pose as Stan Morris wrote to me. So you guys can write these down, but they are all on Bernie Clark's website. Mm -hmm. But you're welcome to. This is a condensed version. So what we do is we present a pose and we encourage students to play with their edges. So you come into a pose to where you first feel just an edge of resistance. Okay? And you hold it there. So we're not looking at 100%, 110%. You're looking at the first edge of resistance, which is like 60%. And because we hold in poses for longer periods of time, you know, may find that you can slowly, that edge creeps away from you and you can move further into the pose, okay? You might feel that that's where you stay, but it's kind of that first touch. And it's about getting to that point where you go, ah, that's where I first feel the pose. Okay, I'm gonna hang out here. This is where the pose is. So I use props to find that edge. Because sometimes a forward fold, um, let's say standing forward fold, Maybe without props, it's already past my edge. How can I use props to help me ease the pose slightly? Okay. So it's not about getting, there's not so much about what the pose looks like. Poses can look incredibly different in different bodies. They'll prop differently. In fact, give our students two to three options. So they can choose one because you're going to be there for four or five minutes. You want to have a good time. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, you're supposed to feel certain stress in terms of you will feel sensation in the body but it's moderate mm -hmm. amount of stress over prolonged periods of time okay i like this quote that says yang is about changing the world and yin accepts the world as it is so it's just allowing this is how it is so we don't really have any specific attitude of i need to be somewhere I need to do something this is what it needs to look like it is what it is so it's quite allowing which is nice. Once I've come into the pose for an appropriate depth or I've moved to a moderate amount of um, stress, now I remain, I resolve to remain still. Okay. Now, of course, if I was experiencing any pain or discomfort, then you would tell them to um, move up, or maybe you'll be moving to move deeper into the pose. So if we look at what advice made a funny A like that. So there's always a linking back to nature in terms of. When we find stillness, we're looking for stillness in the body, like a mountain that's unaffected by the wind. Stillness of the breath, a gentle and unlabored like an ocean. Gentle and... Oh, I think that's for 
be a dash. I wonder why they have a funny symbol. Anyway, stillness of the break, gentle and unlabored like an ocean. You know when it's a beautiful day in Cape Town and the ocean is like glass? Mm -hmm. There's like a gentle breeze and it just like creates like small little ripples but not enough to create waves. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what I picture that like. So the break, we regular natural breathing. Just like we said, just awareness of breath. There's no way you need to breathe because that's pretty yang-like in its own to tell someone how to breathe. Just let your breath be as it is. And then stillness of the mind, mind like a blue sky with clouds just drifting on by. Thoughts may come and then they just move away. And your thoughts are your clouds and so you constantly bring your awareness back to a still blue sky. Okay? So we hold the pose for, depending on the pose, we hold it for different amounts of time. And so you can work progressively as you become more familiar with the practice to hold them for longer. Okay. And then once I've remained still for a while. Okay. Then you hold it for time. So time is more important than intensity. Okay. So rather do, not rather, but we're looking at five minutes at 60% rather than one minute at 90 percent okay because our yin tissues our connective tissues our joints our tendons and ligaments like prolonged tension or moderate tension over prolonged periods of time so it is about the whole okay so you notice your sensations sometimes you're doing a class and you during that time you either want to run away <laughs> okay well this is ridiculous <laughs> Or you try to change what's happening. No, I don't, you know, I want to be here, I want to move this, I want to change my props, I want to do that. So our mind sometimes, not plays tricks, but it doesn't want to be in a comfortable situation. So I want to move or fidget or come out of the pose. Or you just go, okay, well, I just give up. This is horrible, but I'm just going to be here anyway. <laughs> or you just accept it as is. Okay? Not that yet is ever horrible, but sometimes it's, it's a challenge in itself. And we find it quite difficult the busy our lives get to be still. It's really hard being still. Yes. And so that's where the challenge comes in. We, we almost feel like we want to run away or do something. Maybe you don't feel like that at all, but sometimes that's the case. Other people might love and gravitate towards it and never feel like they want to run away because it's the only time they still us. Okay? Then when I'm held for some time, I need to obviously come out of the pose. So we come out of the pose just as we come in. Oh, canvas, glitchy. Okay, so we come out just as we come in, we move slowly and steadily. And because we've kind of had this moment of extended time in a pose, when we come out of it, it's almost as if during that entire time, our tissues have been under a moderate amount of stress. So there will be an element of stretch and creep that is experienced in the tissues, which just means that there has been, if I'm using the word lengthening, there's kind of been this creep that happens in the tendons, ligaments, joints, and so we don't want to rush into something. We want to take it slow and gently, and then we take a moment to do like a rebound, okay? So I come out of the pose, and then I pause, and then I notice, okay, what did that feel like? What sensations come up? If I've been crossing my legs for an extended period of time, especially if we look at the energetic body, we look at, okay, I've been maybe compressing to the back of my leg, what does it feel now when I straighten my leg and then maybe blood flow, energy flow back to that leg, we notice what that feels like. So it's kind of like this echo after we come out of the pose. There's still an aspect of the pose that's lingering in the body. It's kind of like coming into down and facing dog after being a pigeon. That feeling. And then you pause and you notice and you bring awareness back. Yeah. And then we often have a bit of a counter pose where we just ease into the body and then move into the next one. So if I've been doing a lot of forward folds, I may do a gentle back bend and then into the next pose. Okay. But it's very gentle and slow and restorative and easy. Okay. Any questions about that? I'm flying through this quickly, guys. Just give you a, I rather want to have a longer practice. Okay. So. I'm going to show you some of the yin yoga poses and there are some pictures I took for our manual so they do look a bit odd not odd they'll be they'll look different okay but we're going to practice them today oh sorry one more thing so in yin yoga there's some important aspects that are sometimes different
different from what we know in vinyasa. It's just regular breathing. So there's no forceful breath. You can do ujjayi and some focused breathing, but most of the time we're hardly cueing inhales or exhales. It's just natural. We focus on simple awareness, so constantly bringing in those mindfulness cues of back to the moment. That's often done through somatic markers, like um, notice your feet making contact with the floor, uh, feeling your body on the prop. So bringing awareness back to sensations that are happening in the physical body. And one aspect I love from one of our teachers, Carla, who used to teach her, she said it's like teach, teaching students to fly their own plane. So I don't adjust, I don't tell them what variation of the prop they must do. I simply offer it and they make the decision. They get to make this their own practice. I'm merely facilitating the space for them. And so I love that. I think it's a lot more empowering and um, yeah, facilitating for them that this is their practice. And I like that. Okay. Often don't we don't do adjustments because even adjustments are very yang like. Like, why do I want to change your set shape? You chose that one for a reason, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> so it's very much like a, of course, there's structure in it, but it very is much like, well, you can do that, that works for you. Okay. So if we look at some of the poses, some of them will look very similar. Okay. So mm, this top left here, this is Anhatasana, which is puppy's pose. The names also have slightly different names because um, we don't use Sanskrit names because of the influence from different ideologies. So a lot of them have their own names. Okay. So puppy's pose, you could do puppy's pose with a bolster under your chest here to make it a little bit easier. We would always prop to maybe make it a little bit more intense or make it less intense to find your edge. Okay. So puppy's pose is really nice. We have Shavasana, which is called um, pentacle pose. But also called Shavasana. It's like kind of the only one that has a <laughs> Sanskrit name. This one we're going to do later is called um, Vananasana. <laughs> I don't make this stuff up, guys. I wish I did. <laughs> banana pose, because it's exactly what it is banana. Okay? This is a bridge pose, a supported bridge. So we don't do bridge with the hips lifted because it's too much work in the body. I want to, we want the body to be supported. If the bones are supported, the muscles are, are relaxed, or muscles can relax. When I relax my muscles, I can get into the connective tissue. That being said, if I was doing a seated forward fold, a certain amount of muscular engagement is needed for me to sit up, but I'm working, my main focus is to stretch around the glutes, so I relax as much as I can in order to maintain the shape. So I tend to try to relax the area that is the focus. So in bridge pose, as soon as I support my sacrum, my hips can relax, and then I can really feel a stretch through the front of the body, get a little bit of hip extension, and work through the body with different feet. So it's a lot more held, but just because it's supported doesn't mean it's always easier. Okay? This is a variation of supine butterfly that we did this morning, except you see I've placed a bolster on an incline, and I've also got blocks underneath my thighs that hold my knees there, which is also really nice. <laughs> yeah. This is butterfly, butterfly. So it's supine butterfly. Yeah. English name, some of them have similar names. Yeah. This is butterfly folding forward. So if I'm going to spend a couple of minutes there, I want it to feel good, right? So a lot of props. Often supporting the torso in forward folds as well as supporting the head so we don't have the head dangling in space. Okay? Especially because that pose we can hold for up to five minutes. It, I promise it feels great. Okay. Then, okay, this is a half butterfly. So these two are both half butterfly. It's similar to Janu Susasana. Okay? But once again, I can fold forward with my elbows on blocks. Here I'm taking like a Hari Britta Janu Susasana. Okay, remember we did that one last week. But now it's more like a half butterfly side stretch to get into the side of the body. It's passive. I know it's something you can't see in the photo, but I'm not working hard to hold it. I'm kind of softening into it. Okay, same with this one. I'm holding my head so I don't have to let it dangle in space. Okay, this is Caterpillar. So forward fold, once again, 
lots of props holding me there because in, in this pose, I'm just working through the back of my hamstrings. I'm still feeling my hamstrings and my spine with support, and that's where my edge is. Okay? <laughs> this is my favorite. You can see how happy I look. <laughs> <laughs> this is child's pose. It's the best thing you'll ever do in your life. Mm -hmm. So, child's pose over a bolster. Oh, feels so nice. And for some students, if the flexibility didn't, uh, flexibility didn't allow for it, they would just prop more bolsters. You just have like four bolsters there. Why not? Okay. This, um, this would probably be a nicer variation for our group that didn't like straddle so much. Support it more and you bend the knees. Okay. Here's dangling pose, which is like ragdoll. Except I know it looks funny, but if you try it, it feels great. To support the head so I'm not folding forward as far. So we're already starting to see how the poses look differently. You see that in these poses, I'm rounding my spine, I'm softening into it. I don't have to have active legs and flexed feet. Okay. We do a variation of lizard, it's called dragon. And just like our vinyasa, we can do dragon in a twist. We can do it on our hands. We can do it um, more in like an unjanyasa variation. You can offer modifications with the intention of why. Because our intention is always to find a little bit more softness into it. And so when we want to move further and offer something more, we just go, well, what is the intention? How can I make this pose a bit softer and still find my edge? Happy baby with the tailbone supported with the bolster. Sometimes it pulls up naturally, so you just kind of fill the space by propping the top. Here I've got sphinx pose with my elbows resting on a bolster. I could also just be holding my head. It's a lot softer and gentler. This is a frog pose. Mm -hmm. Who's done this pose before? It's not relaxing at all. You can't see that I'm lying on a bolster. When you lie on a bolster, it does feel very different. Your variation would just be taking your child's pose. But if you can see, just a, a bit of a theme I wanted to show you guys, anytime I'm reclining, I'm over a bolster. If I'm forward folding, I'm on a bolster. If anything's hovering in the air, I'm propping a block underneath it. Just so that I can soften the body a little bit. Well, from the other day, you're sitting on the bolster. I'm lying, my tummy's on the bolster. So it's between my legs like this. <laughs> so it doesn't take much out of the... You could slide it all the way back and put two there. Yeah, you would prop as much because that pose is really quite strong on the adductors. So, different options there. You would, this is just square pose, um, normal cross legged. An option would be to fold forward. Okay. So, it offers a ton of variations, but um, these are the main poses. Okay. Gorgo Kasana, we did that last week, cow face pose. This is how you could do squat. Sorry, this is called shoelace. I forgot to tell you that. Okay. Shoelace is with Gomakasana legs. Okay. We can do squat, sitting on blocks up against the wall. Feels good. Okay. Pigeon is called swan. Okay, so you get sleeping swan and proud swan. Proud swan is a bit more the, the upright back bend version. This is called sleeping swan. Figure four is an eye of the needle. It's called eye of the needle. You don't remember all of this, I'm just telling you how it's different. Okay, this is kind of, it's not really got its own name, it's just a hamstring stretch, but we often do it with the strap because you can hold it there for long periods of time and when your leg's hovering on a bolster, it feels quite nice. Okay, and then I've got, here's a supine twist. You've got a whole lot of recline twist variations like they, I've got um, eagle legs. I could also do it with both knees together or our more traditional way where we just bring one leg across. Okay. So that is kind of how a sequence would look. Do you see how many poses I have in a 60 minute class? Okay. There are a couple of additional poses I didn't show in there because they are, it's not a lot. I think there's about 18, 18 poses. Oh, there's not that many, but there's a lot of variations within them. Okay, so here you've got toe squat where I tuck my toes under and send my hips back. 
That's another pose that we get. But you see this pose, three minutes, two minutes, four minutes, three. Then I've got three minutes, one side, three minutes, another. And so by the time I've done this class, it's 60 minutes. Okay. One more thing I just want to show you guys, um, just because I don't think it fully gives the full expanse. What do I? Um, the full expanse of the poses. Okay. I took, I just want to show you, these are the photos I took for the yin yoga training. So I know it's quite small on the screen there, but I wanted to just show you, let's say those four poses. One, two, three, four. It's like four different variations we would offer in terms of one shape. Because someone might be happy with their bolster under their chest, some may not. And they rather want to lift their body up. Okay, so we offer students as many different variations as we find one that they can feel relaxed in. Okay. So in our yin class, in our yin training, we go through all of these beautiful little poses and we look at how we prop every single one for each body and we help. Well, I think it's also empowering for students to find a variation that works for them. So students will be able to go, oh, I've experienced that before. Now I know when I do spins, it works better for my body than I do the spin. Any questions? So I was like, 40 minutes here. Yeah, great. I want to just do a practice with you guys because I think that's the best way to do it. Okay. So what I want you guys to grab at home is grab yourself a bolster. If you don't have a bolster, I want you to get a thick pillow, but maybe get two or three and then blocks if you have. In studio, have one bolster and two blocks. And then grab a blanket as well, please. One was two blocks left. Yep. I'm probably one. Yeah. We're going to get started lying on our backs. So you can either have a blanket underneath you or over your body, just fiddle around. But just coming to lie in a Shavasana like shape. So extending the legs out wide, our feet hip width apart, arms along the side of the body. And just connecting to the entire back line of the spine, the legs, the hands making contact with the mat. Here's our two blankets. <laughs> and in this simple lying shape, just take a moment to check in with how the body feels in this moment. And simply just bringing your awareness to the natural rhythm of your breath. And as we move through our practice today, as we find stillness in our shapes, we may start to find that the mind wanders. So if that happens, simply acknowledging the thought and letting it pass by so we can continue to bring awareness back to our breath. Using our breath as an anchor, that constantly brings us back into this present moment.
Taking five more full deep breaths here. And then staying with your eyes closed. In fact, I encourage it through most of the session if you can and if you would like to. Bring your feet a little bit wider to the edges of the mat. Might be a bit of a fidget with the blankets, but that's fine. We're simply going to take the left ankle and hook it over the right. And then from here, sweeping the arms up overhead. You can grab opposite elbows, maybe make a cactus with the arms. And then slowly start to move the upper body over to the right side. So you're curving into a banana or a crescent moon shape. And so you move into the shape to a point where you find the first edge of resistance. May feel a stretch along the entire left side of the body. Maybe drawing a line of awareness from the left heel up the left side of the leg. all the way up along the hip bone, the ribs, the armpit, all the way up along the back of the arm. And simply directing breath to the side. We'll be here for another five breaths. Notice if I say that whether the mind already starts to think about moving out and onto the next shape. To come out of it, we'll slowly just maneuver the upper body back to the center of the mat. Unhook your left foot, take it back towards the outer left edge of the mat. Slide the arms back along the side of the body and take a moment just to pause. Maybe noticing the effects of the posture on one side of the body or both. There might be a little bit of a maneuver to center the body once more if you felt you have started to lean more onto one side.
And then we'll move over to the other side, taking your right ankle over your left. You can hook the ankle, place them next to each other, that feels better. And then slide the arms up overhead. If you grab opposite elbows, then let the other variation of the arm happen on this side. <coughs> and then if the body hasn't already moved the body over towards the left side, really feeling a stretch along the entire right side of the body. Maybe drawing that same line of awareness from the right heel, the outside of the right leg, right hip, side of the body, all the way up past the right upper arm. Maybe breathing a bit deeper into the right side. Often when we come into the one side or the second side, we already notice it or observe it compared to the first. So as we move through the poses today, if we're doing one on each side, I encourage you to always look at the second side as if it's brand new. Take five more deep breaths here. To come out of it, you'll bring your upper body back in line or center to the mat. Bring your right angle back to the right side of the mat. And slide the arms along the side of the body. Take a moment just to pause. Observe any sensations as they arise in the body. Gently step your feet onto the mat. And then roll over onto one side. Doesn't matter which side you choose, just pause in a side lying position. And then push through your top hand, gently rise up into a comfortable seat. And we move gently to roll over the ankles onto all fours. So you can face the front of your mat. We're going to move into toes, toe squat first, and then we'll do a nice counter pose for it. So we'll tuck the toes under, so in all fours, tuck the toes onto the mat. And then I want you to reach back and then just see if you can get that little pinky toe involved in the tuck, because sometimes it escapes a little bit. So just get it involved too. <laughs> And then your hands will come out in front of you. 
Turn your palms um, onto the mat with the fingertips back towards the knees. Okay. And then gently send your hips back so that you're working through a stretch through the tops of through the backs of the feet, to so the soles of the feet, and then also through the forearms. And so you want to find that first edge. So you may move. When you feel that like you've got that first point of resistance, just pause and hold there. But if it's too much, you simply move out of it. We usually hold these poses for a little bit shorter because of the intensity. So we'll be here for another five breaths. Notice whether that's good or bad news. <laughs> Gently rock your weight forward into your wrists. I know we've done quite a bit of extension today. Place the tops of the feet onto the mat, facing the palms forward once again. You can either just let the feet relax, tops of the feet, or you might give them a little bit of a tap. Sometimes it feels nice, you might like it, you might not. Try it out, see how it works. Good. And then we'll bring our knees nice and wide as we move into our supported child's pose. So as we send our hips down to the heels, we're going to create an incline with the bolster. So similar to what we did earlier lying on our back. We're going to take one um, on like a T shape and the other one at the top, and either be on its highest or on its middle. And what that does is it's going to create an incline with the bolster. So what I like to do, and it's really helpful, is as I fall forward, I'm going to hold my block in place, okay? It doesn't have to be that high, it can be on a middle level. And it's just about creating kind of an incline. So then put your closer blocks here on the middle and that on the highest, whatever the case may be. And you're going to fall forward over the bolster. If it's on the highest, you're simply going to place it there. And it does help to keep a slight little angle. Hold the bolster, or hold the block, and hold the bolster. So often we need two bolsters for this one, but we don't quite have the numbers for that. But either one that you've chosen, see if you can really soften into the support of the bolster. For some of us, it actually feels quite nice to have it on the, to not have the top one on the highest level. So you might want to try it out either on the highest level or the middle. And then you're welcome to rest one cheek onto the bolster. And I'll let you know when it's halfway you can move over to the other side. So you want to find a variation of a position that you can maintain for a couple of minutes. So you can spend the first few moments really playing around. Maybe it feels better to not have the bolster at all, to not have any props. It should feel as though the props are supporting and holding the body in a way that there may still be sensation on the tops of the feet, Maybe you feel sensation through the inner thighs, the chest possibly making contact with the bolster, but there's still an element of softening into the shape.
Your head is facing over onto one side. You can gently move it over to the other. We'll be here for another five breaths. Slowly and gently use the support of your hands to lift yourself up into a kneeling position. Keep your blocks and your bolsters close by, maybe just off the side of the mat. We'll take a bit of a rebound of lying out really. So you'll bring the elbows forward, move slowly to come to lie down. Tops of the hands on the mat, forehead resting on the hands. Forehead or one cheek, maybe a gentle, movement of the hip from side to side and then in this position just check in how the body's feeling Our next pose is going to be a sphinx shape. So you'll slowly lift up onto your elbows. And in our yin version, our elbows are slightly forward of the shoulders. And so once again, there's plenty of variations you can do here. So we're looking for slight extension and sensation in the lower spine. So one option is to hold the block and to rest your forehead onto the block. You can also simply Cradle the head in the hands. And if you would like another gentle variation, you can just slide your bolster between your chest and your elbows. Simply come into a nice forward fold. Kind of a forward fold, but still an extension. So I'm softening over my bolster, working with gentle stretch to the front of the body. Good. So you can simply just take a variation where you're resting on the elbows. There's no right or wrong way to do a pose, just simple options. As we progress into the pose, I will give the options to move into more of a spinal extension. And if you're happy, you just say as you are. Stay here. If you would like to move into more extension for the last minute, you can either maybe prop 
your elbows onto a bolster or onto blocks. Once again, even with your elbows on a bolster, you can support the head, still maintaining contact points between the hips and the floor. The shoulders can relax and lift gently up towards the ears, it's fine. And you relax your hands down onto the floor. Slide the ball so any blocks over. And once again, just come to lie over on, on top of your hands and give a gentle rock from side to side in the hips. Just once again, notice the connection points between your belly and the floor this time. And then bringing your hands underneath the shoulders. We'll take it nice and slow and gentle, rising back up into an all fours position. So a little bit of work needed here. We'll swing the legs over onto one side. And see the legs out in front of you. We'll take a caterpillar pose. We've done quite a lot of back bending today, so we'll end it off with a forward fold and some twists. So in your caterpillar, so that's kind of like a seated forward fold, you, what works really nicely is to take your bolster horizontally over your body. You can still have a bit of support for your head, either on the full or the lowest level, and really get this bolster into the crease of the body. Okay. Once again, you can even just support your head. If I hook my elbows on the end of the bolster, I can hold my head like this. And so in this pose, feeling the backs of the legs and the rounding of the spine. Finding that first edge of resistance and holding it there. At any time, if you feel the knees need a soft bend, just try to bolster or blanket underneath it just to find a little bit of a bend. Might come out quite nice. <laughs>
Notice where your mind goes when we hold the postures. Constantly bringing awareness back to the breath, the body. Be here for another minute. So take your time to gently bring yourself back up into a seat. Placing your bolster over to your left side. Step your feet onto the mat. Bring your fingertips behind you. Just with a bit of a counter pose. Push into the fingertips, lift the chest. Get a cycle extension into the upper back. You can move the neck from side to side. And you may need to scooch slightly forward on your mat. Gently assist yourself back up into a lying position. And as you get there, bring your knees with you into the chest. Find a gentle rock from side to side. So we will be moving into a reclined twist. So I'll offer you the double knee version, but if you prefer a single leg, it's totally fine. So you'll have your arms out into a T-shape, bolsters over towards the left, and then gently roll or twist over towards the left side. You may choose to support the legs on the bolster, or simply allow them to drop down to the floor. If that top shoulder lifts, you can choose to place a bolster or a blanket or a gentle cushion, or just let it hang out there. Sometimes you may feel that you like the bolster, you may not. You can also choose to have the bolster between your knees. And notice what that feels like. While we have the time, we'll be here about three minutes. So you've got the first minute to Play around, explore, notice what it feels like. And going with the version that brings you a sensation through the spine, but also provides you with enough of enough space to relax and soften you.
be here for just under 11 minutes on this side. Slowly come out of it, bring your knees back through to center, take your feet to the edges of the mat, lock the knees together, and just pause for a moment here, simply observing any sensations between the left and the right side, just noticing how the body feels after each pose. And then moving over to the right side. So taking the same or a different variation. Maybe the body needs something slightly different on this side. Just under a minute left of the shape. And you bring your knees back through to center. Once again, step your feet onto the mat, knock the knees. Feet are down, knees together, arms up nice and wide. Just settle onto a bit of a symmetrical position once again. And from here, we'll move into our Shavasana. So you may want to have a bolster under the knees. It's really quite nice, especially after the back ends of the day. Today. Start to slide your feet to straight. 
And if, of course, there is another variation that works for you, you are welcome to take that for your shavasana as well. Take a few moments to find stillness in the body. Allow the body to find heaviness on the mat below you. Maybe noticing if there's any places in which you can soften the body just 10 to 15 percent more. Can we start to just bring your awareness back to any sensations in your surroundings? Maybe sounds distant or near. Any sensations you can feel? Maybe a blanket, props, clothing. And start to rub the fingertips find gentle movement into the toes. Almost as if you are observing for the first time what this feels like.
And then gently bend both knees, step the feet onto the mat. Roll over onto one side. And you can keep your eyes closed as you make your way up into a comfortable seat. In your comfortable seat, pausing once again, observing this change in orientation. Hands through heart center, thumb to touch the front of the chest, setting off your practice in any way you wish. When you are ready, gently blinking open the eyes. Getting used to the lighting, that's dark now. I'm not quite sure whether I want to ask the feedback yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a little taste of a yin class. It was only a 40 minute class, really, 45 ish. So usually we end about 75 minutes. It's good, a bit more, more props, more relaxation. Does anyone want to share anything? Those who tried it for the first time, how it made a different friendship for you were a fan of your new ball? No, no. Oh, no, 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 first time. Oh, first time. Uh, you were nodding quite a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very hard. Yeah. Yeah. Very hard? How so? Like, we just get yeah. Into. Did anyone else find it challenging to be still? Maybe a little bit. It's like the body's always wants to fit it. It's like, okay, where, where am I going now? What am I doing? But that's a normal thing. And it's just like a muscle. It also becomes like you, you work on it over time. The mind is also a muscle in terms of finding stillness, being okay with stillness, because we always want to do more, be more, be more productive. So it's a nice way for us to enforce a little bit more quiet. It's also like a, again, being used to it because like throughout the whole positive time. Yeah. <laughs> and then it's like later on, shall I sell it? And then the whole body's like, oh, yeah, you know what to do. And everything gets relaxed. Yeah. So Lily was saying, it's like the more, yeah, you always think there's something more that's coming. No, that's, that's it. <laughs> but the, when you buy the time you get to Shabbat, you don't need as long because you've been prepping. So more like, I feel that. Yeah, like in, in the way I thought it was more like kind of Shabbasana, and you and like I, I do it and like my body kind of like recognize it as this day of the day, this oh, day of time yeah. to relax. So like that was a lot easier. I could have stayed like I can yeah. stay a lot longer in Shabbasana, not because I'm more comfortable, but because my body kind of recognizes that like this is still less is what you used to, which the other is always kind of like oh, this is so let me say it's like your body recognizes Shavasana, like you can enjoy it while you're I think it was more Shavasana was more enjoyable for me because leading up to that point, your body was really yeah. You, you, you spend so much time tapping into that stillness. For you guys online, anything you would like to share? I love being yoga so much. I could just do everything doing it. I don't find it like a struggle not to move. I just go like straight into meditation as soon as I'm chilling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, when I go to classes now, because I still do a lot of calls, my <laughs> we love handstands, but also, I mean, yeah. <laughs> so when someone teaches like normal bridge without a block, I'm, I'm just like, wait, wait what? <laughs> you mean I have to actually lift my hips up, like with my muscles, no, no. So I'll just use this block instead. So yeah, it's something different. So once again, it's a complementary practice. It's a lot more restorative and meditative, but it's a beautiful practice to teach because a lot of people need this. Mm -hmm. um, we don't slow down enough. So as a complementary practice, even if you surprise your students every now and then with the start of the mm -hmm. class, people tend to love it because it's just so calming. Is it totally brown hard to mix to? No, like, not at all. It's like not trying to do like an hour and a half, then you have to pass in the last half an hour, it's yeah, and the first hour. Or so. 
like to to mix to uh, participants. Like, so, so are you asking like, like is it fine to do some flow and then hold it because it's totally fine? You get like they call it kind of another fusion, another urethra, like the vinyasa. Um, but uh, so yes, you can. In fact, we do teach them the yin training too. What does it feel like to for people who struggle with stillness, which is a lot of us, and some days it's different, to do a little bit of movement and then hold. Then get that little movement up, then hold. And there's definitely a benefit in it. And sometimes it's also it's another like segue into yin yoga. We don't have to do a 90-minute class. We can do little circuits. So from a physiological point of view, it's not recommended to do that yin and then like do vigorous vinyasa after that. But you, the vinyasa you'll do will still be phased. It'll be like a slow flow and then long holds. Slow flow, long holds. And then you find a little bit of a balance between the two. But I think it's totally fine. It's sometimes our body needs that. And it's good. Cool. Anything else? Yeah. Perfect, guys. Have a wonderful evening. I will see you all tomorrow morning, and I hope this sets you up for a wonderful evening of rest.